<laughs> Hello, precious people. Oh my goodness, I am so excited about our guests and about my team members that are going to be part of this conversation. I'd like to start by introducing the people you're going to be hearing from. Uh, I'm going to start with Sean Farley, who is not only my co-host, but a musical genius. He is putting his original music imprint on this project. And he is willing to dive in and really hear adoptee stories and understand the context so that he can create something meaningful and powerful that connects. And so we're really glad that Sean is here. So if you hear a really cool, deep radio voice, that would not be me or Stephanie, that would be Sean. So speaking of Stephanie, Stephanie is our creative director, publicist, um, sanity keeper. Mm, yeah, the list is long. And she is a fashion photographer who has lovingly given her time and energy to help create a visual imprint on our project. And what I admire and love about Stephanie's photography is that it emotes, it's emotional. And for me, the subject matter is so important that we need someone that can really capture the essence of what is happening. And Stephanie has that tremendous gift. And so that leads us to our guest who is a young, gorgeous model. And if you're just on audio, I'm sorry, you'll have to look her up to see how beautiful she is. But anyway, and not only is she physically beautiful, her spirit is beautiful. So Stephanie was on Clubhouse and I'm gonna let Stephanie tell you a little bit more about how Sarah connected to us. So Steph, if you wanna jump in, that'd be great. Hello, and thank you for having me today. I'm so excited to talk to Sarah. Um, Sarah and I met through Clubhouse, um, which if you don't know what Clubhouse is, you have to go check it out. Um, but Sarah and I actually met through a group, a, a networking group for photographers, models, you name it. Um, and I had posted in a Discord chat and she happened to reply. Um, I had overheard someone with a quiet voice somehow saying that they were adopted. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I have to talk to this person. And thankfully, um, she replied right away. And from there, it's history. We've been doing some virtual shoots and just her spirit is just awesome. So I'm so excited to hear more from you, Sarah. Oh, thank you for that stuff. Well, Sarah, I would like to read your bio just so people can understand a little bit more about who you are, maybe professionally, and then we'll, we'll get into your adoption story. So Sarah is a multi-talented artist and model who has been creating since 2010. She is based in San Diego. She is a young mom, and she is willing to share her compelling story of adoption with us today. And Sarah, as I was preparing for this interview, it reminded me of a lot of times when I get on stage to do speeches that, that I have to like go through some kind of ritual. <laughs> and I have this box of quotes and I just said like a little, you know, please help me universe be able to <laughs> relay a message that's important. And, and I pulled this card when I was thinking about you from this quote box and I just wanted to read it. Life is not a path of coincidence happenstance and luck, but rather an unexplainable, meticulously charted course for one to touch the lives of others and make a difference in the world. So Sarah, we are just at the beginning of our journey with sharing adoptee stories. And I really believe that these stories have that kind of power. So I just want you to know from my heart to yours, I'm so grateful for what we're going to hear from you and, and for your willingness to be honest about that. And when we talked before on the phone, I had uh, talked to you about, you know, your artwork as well. Mm -hmm. And I just, before we go too deeply, I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about your, your art, not the modeling, but the actual, Yeah. <laughs> maybe talk a little bit about that and what you submitted to Stephanie and why did you choose that picture to submit for the adoption conversation? Can you, can you share that? Yeah. Um, so. As you said, I've been creating since 2010. For my entire life, I've always been drawing, painting, um, and 
since 2010, like I've kind of found my style of mixed media and always incorporating flowers or butterflies or some type of form of nature. Um, I found that it always, like that's just what always came to me. Um, a lot of my artwork it has a theme that centers around growth, um, change and things like that, just because that's kind of the most in my pathway of things that I've always felt aligned with. Um, the reason I submitted the picture that I did is because I created it when I wasn't in that good of a headspace. Um, I felt very down, not myself. Um, I felt really disconnected from a lot of things that were going on with me. I have this habit of sort of detaching myself from situations. And so with that piece, it was a way of me kind of visually representing that feeling of detachment, but there's always that kind of intertwining thing that is keeping me grounded. Um, so that's why that picture is the way that it is with sort of the face disconnected, but still the flowers around it, because I wanted to signify that feeling of still being here, but not necessarily feeling in touch. Wow, Sarah, that's so cool. And for people that haven't seen the art, um, and, and they'll be able to link up to that somehow. But could you just briefly, <clears throat> excuse me, describe it? Like, if we can't see it, what what is it? Because it's super cool if you can put words to it. Yeah, um, so it's a portrait. It's from shoulder up of a female and it's her face, but the top portion of this part, like the where the eye meets the nose is kind of disconnected. And then between that is an outline of the flowers and the leaves. Um, and I kept it really minimal with the flowers just because I didn't want them to distract from the actual portrait itself. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. And I know I had asked you to, to do just a little tiny art project and I wonder if you brought it with you. It's on my iPad. So oh, I draw it is. a lot of digital stuff. So Oh, um, that's so cool. But yeah, so it's actually I think I could probably share my screen, but I don't know if No, that's okay. Don't worry. Okay. We can do we like... can do it later. No, there's no problem with that. So Sarah, I would really just love to just give you space to share as deeply as you know, you would like to your adoption story and it's just really important that people get a really clear, truthful vision of, of these experiences. So we would just love to hear your story. Yeah, um, I never know where to start when I, like someone asks that because I never think of it as a story. I'm just like, well, this is just what I went through. But um, I was born prematurely. This is something I found out last year, but I'll get into that later. But I was born prematurely. And so I was born with three holes in my heart, had a lot of health complications when I was born. Um, and I was in the hospital until I was about four or five months old. And that's when my family who adopted me got me out of the hospital. Um, I've been with them my whole life. They adopted me when I was four years old. The reason being they didn't adopt me as quickly is my entire family is black and I am white. And so there's a lot of pushback from the system about them adopting me and whatnot. Um, and so they adopted me and we, there's seven of us. So they adopted six children before me. So all of my siblings are adopted and um, I was the, one of the last ones to get adopted. And then I've been with them my whole life, but um yeah, so then growing up, we always had a foster child with us. So we were always fostering like a two or three year old um, and just sort of being that placement home right before they get their permanent home. And so growing up, I was always like a caretaker, if you will, of like helping with the kids and um, like helping guide them and everything. So, yeah. Well, Sarah, you know, I was, I was telling you, you know, I'm 55 and I came out of what I call the fog six months ago, where I really, really understood the gravity of what happened. And, and I think what made me so drawn to you as well is that you're figuring that out at a younger age. And that really, from my perspective, is, is wonderful because it gives you more time to integrate and to heal all the parts and pieces. And when you're speaking about your art and that disconnection, 
I think a lot of adoptees feel that way. It's identity. And I would imagine that in your case, that was even more challenging because you look different and, and you had all mm-hmm. of these experiences. And so what was it like for you like to, to go through that growing up? And yeah, if you're looking I mean, back on it from your perspective now, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, growing up, one of the first questions I always got when I was adopted of like, did you always know you were adopted? And I'm like, well, yeah, it's kind of hard not to when your entire <laughs> family doesn't look like you. Um, and from people not knowing who I was adopted by, they were always like, wow, do you know your parents? Do you know this? And all of this stuff. And I'm like, well, no, I don't. And it got to a point where I almost stopped telling people I was adopted because I just didn't want to deal with the questions because they were questions I didn't have the answer to. And then it kind of felt me, made me feel even more insecure of like, well, these are things I should know about myself because everyone else knows them. So why don't I know them? And so it kind of caused sort of this unknown feeling for like a really long time. Cause I always wondered like, do I have siblings? Does my, like, do my, if I have siblings, do they like art like I do? Do they have a lot of similar interests? Where did I get this art talent from? Did I get it from my mom? Did I get it from my dad? And I always wondered, like, I saw siblings together at school and I would always wonder, like, if I came across someone I was related to, would I know? And then I always sort of, like, wondered, about who I was because I didn't know where I came from. And so not knowing that it just caused a lot of questions Um, and having like family reunions and I would be the only little white kid there. It was just sort of like, I never had anyone who looked like me around except for when I went to school. But then when I went to school, it was like, okay, now I just feel like I don't have anyone because everyone has like this little clique of people or these siblings that they're going to school with or they have like this close relationship with their mom. And I remember we would do projects in school and we would do like the family tree and I could never participate in the family tree projects because I didn't know anything of my family tree. And I would go to my mom like, I can't do this project. I don't know what to write. (laughs) Like, I don't know anything about this. And she was like, it's okay. Like, I'll talk to your teacher. Like, we, you could just do it on us. I'll tell you about my mom, blah, blah, blah. But I always felt sort of down because everything that all the other kids got to do with their families, I didn't have that. Um, and so, yeah, it did kind of make me struggle a bit growing up. Yeah, Sarah, thank you for sharing that because I think your ability to recognize that is so powerful because I think there's a loneliness that exists that's really hard to describe. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my my husky is barking in the background. Of course, it's in your <laughs> real life. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm so glad because I can. <laughs> so, Sarah, you know, one thing you said that it leads to another question. You and I were talking about this too. Is I think for me, I always wanted to know. I was always curious, and I think adoptees are all over the place about that issue. But for me, it was a burning desire to know my whole entire life. And I was so conflicted with guilt of hurting my adopted family. And there was this turmoil. But the turning point for me is when I had my son. And when I looked into my son's face for the first time, and it's always emotional, he was the first birth relative I ever met. And Sarah, like, that's when you don't, when you're adopted and you don't have the genetic mirror. There is something so primally activating about that. And at that moment, I knew this isn't just about me anymore. This is about my child. I have to find my roots and know as much as I possibly can to to fill in the blanks for him as well as myself. And I just wonder if you can tell us, I know you're the mom of a beautiful little girl. If you can explain like what your experience was and if that intensified it. And I'd also love to know, know more about your reunion with your birth family. Yeah. So, um, I like the blood mirroring that you're talking about when I met my daughter and I held her for the first time, it was such this overwhelming feeling of just like love and protectiveness. And like, when I got to know her more, like we, like just being a mom, everything that I was feeling, it sort of created more questions for me because I was like, if I feel this strongly and I love this little girl more than my, like more than anything, and I would do anything in the world for her, why is it 
that my bio mom, when she had me, was so willing to give me up. And so for me, it was kind of really hard. And I went through postpartum for an entire year of just like not wanting to be here. It was really rough. And it created a lot of questions because I was just like, how can anyone give up a child when they feel this, when they like give birth? Like, I don't understand. And so it created this feeling of feeling like my mom didn't want me. And like, it was really hard because it just created more questions. And so I always had this uneasiness about meeting my bio mom because I didn't want those answers, like those questions answered because I was like, well, what if she didn't want me? Like, what if I meet her and she's like, well, I don't want you here. Or I gave you up for a reason. Why are you contacting me? And so I always had this fear of reaching out. And then my husband, he convinced me and also surprised me. Cause it was like, a, it was a Valentine's day present. He's like, I got you the 23 in me. We're doing this. We're doing it together. And I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> and so I took the 23 in me test and, um, you get the results within like three weeks. And so I forgot I took the test to be honest. I was just, I took it, sent it in and forgot about it. And then I get a message and it's from my bio sister. And she's like, Hey, like, and I'm like, wait, what? She's like, Hey, I cannot believe I found you. I have been looking for you literally since you were born. And I was just like, wait, what? And she's like, yeah, like, um, like your mom's name's June and you have two other siblings or three other siblings. And like, this is Rachel. She lives with me. It's my little sister and Carrie, she's the oldest, but she's like, this is Rachel. And she lives with me. She's at school, but she wants to meet you. And like, I've been looking for you forever but your adoption was closed. So I couldn't get any information. And then this is June, like your mom, if you want to talk to her, but I understand if not. And I was just like overloaded in one day within two hours of just being connected to everyone that was biologically related to me. And I was just like, what is going on? This is so much. It was like complete shock overload. And then I finally like gained the courage to talk to my bio mom. And she was just so excited you have found me and it just like a lot of relief <laughs> and oh, like dear. I knew that she was having a hard time because she had opened up to me she's like I have so much that I want to tell you but I'm not ready yet but like any questions that you have just ask them and I'll answer them like any of them and I guess that because my adoption was closed so with my other siblings they had open adoption so they got to have visitation with June but for me my parents made the decision to like do a closed adoption and just cut all of that off and so to know that they were looking for me and that I was wanted, it just kind of gave me a really big sense of relief. And so when I was talking to my bio mom, it was like, for one, I grew up thinking I was Japanese. I was thinking <laughs> that my bio dad had passed away right before I was born because he was sick and all this stuff. And so I talked to him. Well, first I take the 23 in me. I find out that I'm Thai. I'm not Japanese. I'm Thai. And then I was like, oh, well, that's one big thing. And I thought I knew <laughs> and I didn't. And then my bio mom then says like, by the way, that's not your dad. This is your dad. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a really big thing that I also thought I knew and I don't know now. <laughs> so it was sort of like what I held on to as a kid growing up of like, this is my identity. This is what I at least know a little bit about myself became not true. But then I also gained like, a whole new set of just like family that loves me. And I was just so grateful that I got to connect with them because now it's like, I'm really close to my little sister and it's so crazy because we have different dads, but she's literally like another me. It's so crazy because we're three years apart, but I'm like, you're literally me and another body. Like that's so crazy. And the way that I got to find out that kind of genetic connection of like, it's not it's so different than what the feeling is I have with my adoptive sisters where it's like that blood tie that I didn't understand. I now get, and it's just, it was really crazy being able to connect with them. Oh, Sarah, so, yeah. thank you for, sh thank you for sharing that. You know, I'm really curious. One of the things that, that we aim to do is we want people to have tools to take away from adoptees that have experienced all of the turmoil that goes along with this and the excitement and all of the mystery. 
And I just wonder, you know, you talked about the, the dark times and what can you point to that helped you get through that? Was it, was it your art? Was it just your spirit? Um, like what advice can you give adoptees who are going to seek? Because we don't know what the answers will be. Maybe it'll be a re-rejection. Maybe we'll find that our, our birth mother has passed away. I mean, you really have to kind of prepare yourself emotionally for almost anything to occur. And I just wonder what you have to say about that. I think it's sort of like before you venture out to figure out who your bio family is, know who you are without them first, just because, because I'm so secure in who I am as an artist and so secure in who I, in who I am as what I want to be and me as a mom. And like my life was going so good and I felt full before I reached out to them. I was prepared and automatic, like I was prepared for them to reject me because I was like, I'm doing really good without them in my life. If they don't want to be in my life, then so be it because I'm already doing good, you know? And then I'm like, well, if they do want to be in my life, then that's just more people to love me and be a part of my life. So I think it's sort of like be full in yourself first before you seek trying to find them because otherwise if you do reach out and it goes bad, it can destroy you. And when I was younger, I'm so glad I didn't do it because I had a chance when I was 16 to figure out who they were. And I knew I wasn't ready because I knew I would have been destroyed if it didn't go good. And so I'm really thankful that I waited until I was an adult because I then was able to like fully prepare myself to whatever extent would happen. Thank you, Sarah. You know, you and I talked to in Clubhouse a little bit about the primal wound. And I know you said that was the first time you'd heard of that. And that was part of my experience of coming out of the fog. When, when I discovered the gravity of the trauma that occurs in that situation, yeah, it's very difficult to think about a baby being removed from its original mother and having that written on their psyche. It's a real thing. It's real. And for me, it's manifested in anxiety and other problems. And I know for a lot of adoptees, um, you know, sadly, we're at four times greater risk for suicide. And there, there are a lot of really difficult statistics. And so, you know, sometimes that subconscious stuff gets buried in us and it comes out in other ways. And I think that's just a human experience as well, people that have been through any kind of trauma. But I think when it's at your birth, like the moment you come into this earth, it's it's a big deal. And I just wonder, because that's kind of a new idea to you, does it help you understand yourself a little bit more to know that um, that is that is kind of something that is is real for adoptees? Yeah, I mean, it's so crazy because having that room that we did and talking about all these things mixed with me doing research lately in the past couple months, I've learned new terms to where it's like, these feelings that I was having, I thought I was the only one and I thought I was crazy. And I, was, I thought there was just something wrong with me. Like I had this mentality of this isn't normal. I'm broken. There's no way that what I am thinking and how I'm feeling is normal. And so when we were having that room and having that discussion and you mentioned the primal wound and you described what it was and like what was happening. I was just like, I'm not crazy. <laughs> like <laughs> this, like this is normal. Holy crap. And it gave me peace of mind because now I'm like, now I have a name for it. And if I have a name for something, I know that I can research it and figure out how to better myself and how to resolve these things. And so for me, I've always had a lot of anxiety and we were also talking in that room of like attachment versus detachment of like how it affects your relationships. And for me, I have this tendency to kind of over attached to people and very quickly, <laughs> like <laughs> abnormally quickly. And so within like a few weeks, I'm like, okay, I, I'm now attached to this person and I would do anything for them. And I, I love and adore them. And now I'm like attached. And then I have a hard time of like, if they burn me to let go, because I like try to see the good in everyone. And I'm like, Oh, they didn't mean it. Like I'll just stay. <laughs> it's fine. And so I always thought I was like crazy, but then I figured out like, oh no, I just have a lot of trauma that made me this way. 
So now it's like, I realized, and it's something I'm more aware of now. So now I proceed with caution when I go into like meeting new people and opening up to people, because I'm like, not everyone needs to hear this. (laughs) Not everyone's going (laughs) to want to like deal with all of this. Um, So yeah, it was a new concept for me, but I'm really glad I learned it because it made me more aware. Yeah, Sarah, I think that's really important because one of the things I've been learning is I've been doing research too and, and figuring this all out is when I look back on my relationships, I turned it into being a people pleaser so that no one would leave me. If mm-hmm. I could just do enough, you'll stay. Yeah. And it was never just enough for me to be just me. And, and I don't even know if I know what just me is still yet, because I think my nature is, is like, I want, I want to do for other people. And, and I love, I love doing that. It makes me very happy, but I think there's an extreme where you take it And I know for me, it's really hard to accept that my goodness, you know, it's okay to not just have to be positive constantly and to, and to be real and that people will love you. The people that you want to stay will stay Yeah. because it's exhausting to keep up the, the pace of constantly fighting this thing. Like, I I think for me, it's like the velveteen rabbit where you're becoming real. Yeah. That took me a long time to realize too. Um, with like, I've now, my husband is literally the best person ever. And we've kind of grown together and he's been my solid relationship for my entire adult life. So I've literally quite literally grown up with him because from when you turn 18 and you're like, you're still a kid pretty much, but you're like thinking you're an adult, but now growing with him and him being so like supportive and everything, we've now been talking about these things of being more aware of the relationships. And I do have that tendency to kind of people please. And we realized that I sort of have this thing where like, I've always felt this feeling of why doesn't anyone want to stay? Like as soon as I'm, (laughs) as soon as I get a friend, like that over attachment, right? So I attach really quickly. But then I have, I'm also an empath for any sort of like change in tone or behavior. I'm very overly sensitive to, and I'm like, what's going on? And I overthink everything. And then as soon as they start distancing themselves, I then go to the extreme of, they don't want to be my friend now. Okay. Like, why doesn't anyone want to stay? And I also grew up where I was told a lot of like, don't trust anyone um, don't like let people in, don't like, no one's going to actually be there for you. Like when I left my parents' house, they're kind of like, well, I'll see you next year. And it sort of planted the seed of doubt of like, no one's going to stay in my life. And I already felt that way because I never had that closest best friend growing up because I always like the group of three friends. There's always the two that are closer. I was always the third one that wasn't as close. But I also found that now looking back, I also made it where I didn't try to be the closest. So it was sort of like growing up, I thought it was no one wanted to be my friend. No one wanted to stay in my life, but it was me sort of already distancing myself because I was making it easier for them to not be a part of my life because I was like, well, if I push them first, then I don't have to worry about getting hurt. So if I just don't get close to begin with, then it's fine. But then I found myself now as an adult and I struggled with it a lot because now my husband's working in LA and I'm still in San Diego. And so he's gone most of the day. And I've been struggling the last few months of like, I'm literally alone. Like <laughs> I'm alone every day with my kids. And this is so weird. And I've never actually been on my own because growing up, I was told I shouldn't be. And so, and so now that I am, it sort of created these questions of like, who am I when I'm by myself and I'm not with anyone and no one's here to actually guide me or support me. And it's been tough, but now that I've kind of realized what the issues are and realized why I am the way that I am, it's sort of like, okay, well now I know how to handle it. And now I know what things to do as precautions to like take care of myself and be able to like focus on me and actually be a person versus like dependent on someone. And my husband's been so supportive in realizing like I need to have some time to myself and do things to myself. And so 
it's just been like the last few months of like, okay, I'm finally, finally figuring it out. I'm finally good. Everything's awesome. <laughs> like, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that, Sarah. I, you have, you've had an incredible life to say the least. And, and I think that the awareness, I think the awareness when we wake up and we, we understand what it is we're, we're fighting against, we can, we can start to define it and we can start to, because for me, it was just like this free floating thing. I didn't know what was wrong. And, and now that I understand it, I can maybe stop myself. And I think that it's such a beautiful thing also for our children to witness that we're continuing to grow and evolve and, and become yeah. better and more connected to ourselves and then hopefully to others. And, and Sarah, I would love, um, I'd love to give Sean and Steph time to talk to you. But one thing I would love to know more about is, you know, for me, fashion, obviously not lately, <laughs> but yeah, I feel like as an adoptee personally, that the way that we express ourselves, even through fashion, is art, like our body becomes artwork. And I think what you choose says a lot about you. Like I would have to say that I choose black every freaking day. So I'm not sure how you want to analyze that. But but I think that fashion is is a statement to ourselves and to the world and what we pick. And when I see your images, you know, it's just really cool to me that you're able to able to do that. And I wonder how you got into the fashion industry and and why that's important to you and what what does it do for you as a person because I know it's more than pretty pictures for you I, I, yeah. I don't want to assume but I'm pretty sure um just before I answer this can you still hear me okay because I think my mic just died yeah okay um <laughs> but <laughs> so for me I started because all right. So like I said, my entire life has been creating, like literally every art form I could get my hands into. I was all for, I was willing to try literally anything that involved self-expression. Um, I started out like, even when my mom, she would do this thing. And I remember it would be like a once a month tradition of we would go to Walmart and all of me and my siblings would be able to choose one toy, but I was never a toy person. I was like, I want the paint by number. I want that coloring book. I want this like art set. Like that was just always me. I was never into toys. I was always into some type of doing something where I could do something with my hands. And so that progressed. And when I got to high school, there was a film photography class. There was 3D sculpting and there was art. And when you're at my school, you could choose three electives to get to like a college. You have to do one year of Spanish or two years of Spanish and blah, blah, blah. But I knew already, I was like, I'm going to art institute. I don't need a language. So I want to just take three art classes. And my guidance counselor was like, are you sure you don't want to go to a university? And I'm like, I'm going to art school. I don't need it. Like I was already in my head. Like I knew since fifth grade, like art institute was a school I was going to go to. Like I had it set in my head, like art is my pathway. And so high school, I started a photography class and that kind of became my second passion of I was doing film photography and we were working in the dark room and I like learned my way around the camera. And the reason why I chose photography is because I was already very into modeling and because I couldn't model yet because my parents were like, no, you're too young and we don't want you in the industry. Like, we don't want you to be a part of that yet. I don't think it'll be good for your mind and blah, blah, blah. And so I was like, well, this is the next best thing because now I could just take pictures of people. And so it was my way of like self-expressing. And then me and my friends would do like little mini shoots and pretend like we're doing modeling <laughs> photo shoots. And I was just always really into it, but because I couldn't do it, I took the other route of being behind the camera. And so I ended up getting a scholarship to Art Institute. And then I went on that path. Like I said, I was going to, like that's something that's always been part of me of like, I set my mind to something, I'm gonna do it. And I'm very like, stubborn but also determined of like this is what I'm gonna do and so going to art institute that's where I met my husband and he was a photographer as well and I we were doing photo projects together I was putting my art into art shows and like showing in galleries and doing all of that and there was a designer at our school who like I ended up doing like a little show for 
like a fashion show and I was like holy crap I can start modeling now like (laughs) I'm out of school I'm an adult like I could do this and until that show I was like not thinking about it because it had already passed my brain but then as soon as I got a little taste of it I just completely ran with it and she ended up showing for LA Fashion Week and I ended up walking for her and then she ended up like every fashion show she got booked for I was like one of the models that she always booked and then that turned into I was walking for her but then when we would go to do fittings they were casting for other designers so then I was like okay I'll just go cast for other designers too like what's the worst that can happen and it really honestly snowballed in a way that I did not expect. Like I was not expecting to actually be able to get into modeling and get as far as I have, especially in a short amount of time. Uh, within, I think four or five months of modeling, I had already done LA Fashion Week. I had already done like three other local shows, shoot, like I shot like a couple of photo shoots within a few months. And so it really just snowballed, but then, I got pregnant <laughs> and I was modeling up until I was about five months pregnant because I really didn't show that much but then I had Avery and then as soon as I had Avery within like two or three weeks the designer that had always worked walked for us she was like okay so when are you getting back into it because I have a show in a couple months and I'm like well I guess I'm getting back into it in a couple months <laughs> like you need me for a show and i like I said, I've always been really determined. And so I walked for her in that. And then I ended up joining some Facebook groups and just shooting locally until I built up my portfolio. And then I kind of figured out what kind of modeling I want to do. I figured out my niche of like, this is who I am. So let me follow this. And it really just snowball is the only word I can think of because one thing came after another and it was always word of mouth where I didn't attend a lot of castings because people that I would, was working with were like, oh, use this person for this. And so I just kind of consistently booked and then COVID happened, but now I'm getting back into it. So it's fine. <laughs> but yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that, Sarah. So for our project, for Pulled by the Root, for us, the creative and visual and also audio with music, being able to combine all of those layers to give people a felt experience, I think is so powerful. And, you know, luckily with Stephanie and her skills and Sean and his and the others on our team, we really want to use the art as as a way to communicate how it feels to be adopted and also the hope and the healing and the strength of adoptees. And, you know, I just, uh, it's just so cool to me that you're expressing yourself in such, such a way that is so connected and, and I just uh, appreciate you sharing all of that. And Steph and Sean, I don't know if, if you have any questions for, for Sarah before we wrap things up. Yeah, I have a couple things. Um, and feel free to cut this out if it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, but I just, you know, Sarah, I just wanna say I have had so much fun getting to know you. Um, we have done, just so everybody else in here can know, we've done a couple of shoots um, at your house, COVID style, virtual shoots. And this woman is incredibly patient, incredibly kind, incredibly talented. Um, I have felt so fortunate to be able to uh, do these shoots with you and just practice. And one of the most fascinating things about doing these virtual shoots is that Sarah has to not only get herself ready but also has to set the stage for what we're shooting and also has to be the troubleshooter so all these things are happening and she's also a mom and somehow she manages to do it and not only just do it but pull it off and it's just incredible um I kind of wanted to touch on you talked about your niche in modeling I I would love to hear what that is I feel like I see it um, in you, but I'd love for you to just kind of verbally explain what that niche is and what it means to you. Yeah. So for me, when modeling, I've always been a storyteller, whether it be in my art, whether it be in modeling or taking pictures or anything that I do is always for me, it's more about the story. Um, for me and modeling, my job as a model is quite literally portray the vision of 
the makeup artist, of the photographer. I am more so a vessel where I think a lot of models don't realize is you're not modeling yourself. You're modeling the makeup. You're modeling the product. You're modeling the clothes. So it's like, for me, because I'm adopted and I've always had this sort of detachment of self of not kind of realizing, it's sort of really easy for me to be on camera because for me, when I'm modeling, I am portraying someone. I'm not being me. And so whether it be like, oh, give me a moody look, give me a happy look, whatever it is, I've always been able to kind of express those things. And so when I'm modeling, I love doing beauty photography I, because it's all about the makeup. I love doing portraits where they're storytelling. Um, so that's sort of my niche that I've kind of found and kind of stuck with because to me, it feels the most realistic and true to me. And I find it quite easy to be able to portray those things. One, because I probably have the emotions to be able to portray it, but also because I am an artist and because I've been on like behind the camera and in front of the camera, it's easy for me to kind of understand what the photographer is trying to portray. So then it kind of gives me an upper hand to be able to then go, okay, here is what you're wanting. Um, so that's kind of what I have found my niche is. And it's been really amazing to connect with other photographers and stylists and like makeup artists and everyone I've met along the way who's been a part of building my portfolio. Like, I just love creating. And so being able to combine my love through literally everything into one passion has been awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I, it's, it's been, like I said, it's just been such a joy to get to know you and to hear about your journey. Um, I'm curious to know if there's been a point where you found that it's, uh, more have you found that your journey of being a photographer and an artist has been healing for you has there been points where you know it's been a process to getting to that point of healing or has it always just been something that you just do because you love it um I'd love to hear more a little of both so it started out because I loved it and it was just something that I always found myself wanting to do like growing up and then when I got older and I started going through more things and life happening it became the only way I was able to process my feelings and emotions and the way that my brain works is when I am feeling a certain type of way or I hear a song that makes me feel a certain way my brain's always been able to make visual representations and if I'm not able to get those out I get bottled up and I get anxious and like tense because I'm like the stuff's in my head, I need to get it out. And I found that when I actually paint it or I bring it to life or I get it out, I then sort of have this detachment after of like, now that it's out, I don't feel it anymore. And I've always been able to sort of now, not only because I love it, but because it processes things because my brain is able to then like process, get out, delete, like, and then it's over. Um, so that's always been how it is, but yeah, so it's, it's kind of both. I find that when I'm on set, I, I kind of want to just run through this for a second because I find that when I'm on set, I, it's almost like a, this myself that is deep inside me that I know is there, but it only comes out when I'm on set and that pressure. And I know Heidi's seen it. I know that like we have, we share that. Um, but I'm curious to know is your, when you're on set as a photographer and you're on set as a model, is that the same Sarah, or do you have to kind of tap into like a different part of yourself? I'm just curious because I, I know that has to be very, you know, different or complicated. Um, I would say that it's different because as a photographer, it's that sort of feeling of process of like I have an image in my brain and I need to get it out whereas modeling I'm portraying someone else's vision and so it's a different mindset that I have on set if I'm whatever role that I'm in um for me I've liked modeling more than photography because that's art actually 
I can't say I like one more than the other because I'm like, wait, I do love photography. But uh, for me, when I first started modeling, I was so particular in a vision where like I would have ideas that I wanted to execute. And now I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like a Zoom is happening now. <laughs> but can you guys hear that in the background? Yeah, it just adds texture. It's fine. <laughs> Okay. Um, so for me, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Photography oh. and modeling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for me, like I was particular in the vision that I had when I first started modeling that I was like, I want to do this specific shoot and I want to execute it this specific way. But then I had a hard time finding a photographer who had the same mind process to execute the vision that I was trying to do. So then it turned into like, maybe I should just do self portraits to take pictures of myself and create the vision that I want to do. And because I wanted to model and I had an idea for photography, I'm like, I'll just set it up and do it myself <laughs> because I don't want, like, I'm so particular in every single aspect of the vision. And I found that that still correlates when me and my husband are working together. So I'm like, because we are so similar, but also so different. I'm like, hey, babe, can you just take the pictures and I will just do them, like do the rest of the process, but I just need you there to like execute it. And he's like, okay, cool. So now it's kind of become like this dynamic duo of us kind of getting the visions out of my head when it comes to photography and modeling. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's a different mindset, but my brain's always going and my brain's always like, I want this to look a certain way. And then when I'm modeling, because I've seen the other side of the camera and I know about lenses and I know about focal length, I'm like, okay, you're shooting this part. And I know that I need to turn this way so that it looks this particular way. It's kind of given me an advantage of knowing exactly what's happening. Um, and so it's sort of like my brain is just going a mile a minute, no matter what side of the camera I'm on. <laughs> Yeah, it's so cool to hear about your process, Sarah. And I know we're at our hour right now, and you've you've already given like so much of your time the last. No, two you're weeks, fine. So. I don't even mind. I mean, I'm so, here all day, so it's like. Oh, you're so sweet. You're so <laughs> sweet, Sean. I don't know if you you just wanted to listen in, or if you had any questions. If not, I'll wrap things up. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, uh, Sarah. Your your story has uh, made me uh, shed a few tears in in the middle of the day twice now. <laughs> um, so, but it's, it, it's beautiful. And I just want to thank you for, you know, for the opportunity to hear your story. Thanks for being part of it. Yeah. Sarah, I feel the same way. Um, just so grateful to you and grateful to Stephanie for bringing this beautiful human. And Sarah, I just wanted to know if there's anything we didn't cover, anything that you would like adoptees to know or adopted parents or the adopted community that are hearing this, what are, what are some takeaways for them from your point of view? What do they need to know? Because I think at least my point of view is that everyone just thinks it's a win, win, win situation and they gloss over the tremendous pain and loss that happens. And so I just wonder, you know, if you could just maybe give our listeners and viewers your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think that anyone who's considering the adoption route is to just have grace and be patient with whoever you are adopting. If you're adopting a baby from when they're born or adopting a child who is older, just keep in mind that they're going to have questions and keep in mind that there are things that they're going to go through that you won't necessarily be able to understand, but just have grace in trying to be there to listen and be supportive because we're already questioning ourselves and feeling like we don't belong. And so the more you, you as a parent can make your child feel like they belong and put them in situations where they are able to really blossom and kind of understand that no matter how much you love someone, there's going to be a disconnect um, just because, I mean, biology, like you can't, there's nothing you can really do about it because it's just there. And so it's really just having grace with whoever you do adopt and being open and listening. Like for me personally, I was talking to my husband about like the possibility of adopting a child because, because I've gone through it and I know what happens in the brain and I know the struggles that I went through. I'm like, if we adopt a child, that is one less child that has to go through those questions. 
it's one less child that has to deal with the heartache of not being understood or feeling alone. And so for me, it's like, it's not me saving them. It's me fully understanding what the impact is and knowing that I'm fully prepared of what that means. And so I can be supportive. And I feel like some people who go into the adoption route think they're saving a child, but that's not really the case. It's more so just providing an environment for them to grow and for them to be a human because just treat them as though they are your child and not as though you're adopting them to save them. Sarah, I could have not have said that better. So beautifully said. I think that's such a great point of view because when you're adopted, the reality is you have two sets of parents. And the reality is that there's probably a really difficult reason that you were relinquished. And, and that's a lot to have to go through. And I think this point of view has the opportunity to open people's hearts and minds to thinking about things in a different way. And that's where change takes place. And I'm just so glad that your story is part of that change, Sarah. And thank you so much for the gift of, of your time. We adore you. <laughs> and we'll let you get back to your busy life. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be in touch soon, Sarah. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me and having me be a part of this. I'm really happy to be. Yeah, you're not going to get rid of us. I attach pretty easy so <laughs> okay. <I know. laughs> all right thank you sarah we'll talk again okay bye bye bye, bye. <laughs>